I think the terrorism analogy with cybersecurity works uh, in some ways, and obviously it works in some ways, it doesn't work in other ways. Um, I think that there is that, that financial tie-in that's incredibly important that like, you know, with terrorism, we, we probably went through most of the 90s thinking we don't need to worry about these networks of informal financial because they're really used for family purposes and, and uh, remittances, and they're not that big a deal. Um, and we discovered that that was really not the case. The volumes were huge and, and there was a lot going on. And I think that will be the trend with cryptocurrency that we will say, this is really causing a huge problem. Like um, there, there probably has been a tech a tech bias, if you will, in favor of this cool technology and how it's um, enabling freedom and a lot of sort of you know libertarian values, which I think is great. But but the truth of the matter is that cryptocurrency is really used to facilitate crime. Like that's that's its primary purpose right now. And if we want to eventually reap the benefits, we're going to have to get a handle on on the the really um, salient law enforcement and, and, ter and sort of terrorism issues. The flip side is like, you know, I don't, I don't think of terrorists as sort of meeting in coffee shops and, and hanging out around, you know, conference tables. And what's going on in, in Russia at this point with, cyber, with cybersecurity and ransomware is that like, it's a day job, right? Like you go in and you, um, groups like um, Our Evil that, you know, famously was involved in the, um, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna get this wrong, but I think the colonial pipeline um, ransomware attack was, you know, it, it actually sells its crime as a service. It sells its its ransomware as a service. So you can it, you can actually like sort of just go buy the the or lease the tools, you know, hire the botnet, bring you know, do a bunch of attacks, collect some money, and then pay for all the services that you just did. And it's kind of you're just sort of a middle person click point and click and you can do these attacks um th that i think is is a more sanitized kind of situation than what you get with terrorism where you really need an ideological the the, the people who are really doing this are, are really ideologically driven um, which is not not as true so, so so some of those techniques that we've used to sort of avoid or reduce the level of terrorism um, on the international sphere are, are not necessarily going to apply in the cybersecurity space um but there definitely are 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 um, some ways, and especially on that know that customer, know your customer regulation that we could really benefit from. Um, in terms of differences, like the, the different national characters of the um, countries we worry about in cybersecurity are, uh, it's really totally fascinating, right? So China is much more interested in, in, in looking for industrial secrets and in, uh, trying to gain advantage in um, trying to gain advantage in uh, commercial negotiations and things like that. Um, Russia has been more of what we would traditionally think of as tr cyber crime. Uh, Iran's efforts have been Israel focused or, or more ideological, I would say. Um, you know, and North Korea has run the gamut. Right? <laughs> they've, they've done a little of everything. Um, although it seems like if I had to judge their intent, I would say it's that like, you know, to be able to disrupt and steal and um, and kind of get kudos as the as the baddest guy on the block, like they've been they've been trying to do all of those things at the same time. So, um, but there is there it does tend to be a national character the way these things um, go. Although you know it's, it has I don't think it has anything to do with the, the people. It has to do with sort of the the incentives that are that are built into the way their economies run. So. Um, 